Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Tom talked about how difficult it was to follow Howard. I've got it difficult because I'm following Tom, but not only that, I'm talking about teaching. So it sets the expectation that I'm going to be a brilliant researcher and you're all going to fall in love with me. Well, that may or may not be the case. Right? But what I want to do is we've been teaching a lot for a long period of time, and I, I don't want to detract from anything that Tom said. I agree with Tom 100%. But I'm going to say teaching is also important. Um, and by the way that we manage our teaching, we can become better researchers as well. So it's not just necessarily a zero-sum game, but we have to also be good at teaching. So I was actually at a 60-30 school. We have to be excellent in research and you have to be good in teaching. So you couldn't be weak in teaching. Right? And so that was a, a major issue. So that's what I'm going to try and talk about today. But one thing you'll notice is as you get all these older professors up, they always say two things normally. The first thing they say is, I knew you when you were a PhD student, and I knew Carl when he was a PhD student, and you know, so I've done that part. And the other part is they say, oh, you've got it easy. It was so hard when I was a PhD student, we used to have to walk through 10 foot of snow just to get to the classroom. Right? Um, so I'm going to do that as well. Because I had it tough when I was a PhD student. I did my MBA and PhD at Surface Paradise. I didn't live very far from, where's the round, that's the focus, so just about here is where I lived. And seriously, it's very hard to go to work each day when you live in surface paradise, I mean, um, so it was very tough. And a lot of you who are not from the US, you'll notice that uh, as doctoral students, you're actually faculty members, and you teach everything the faculty members don't want to teach, which is a lot of stuff, a lot of the, you know, the large classes, and you do a million stations, right? And so I've got a picture here of like one of the very first classes that I would teach. That's about how many people I was teaching uh, in every class. Uh, a lot of people. And you might say, they're all Indians? Well, no, they weren't. Um, but I think at one stage I was teaching 15 one-hour tutorials a week. And we had three semesters a year, three trimesters. So we had a two-week break, a two-week break, and a three-week break. So I got my PhD done during those two weeks, those two weeks, those three weeks, before nine in the morning and after five in the afternoon. So I've been successful in saying, oh, you've got it so easy and we had it so hard. Um, but, you know, you wouldn't give it up for all the money in the world. I mean, this, this kind, of, kind of lays the foundation for what you're going to be as a, as a scholar. So, so let's just talk a little bit about this and it will give you an idea about um, my teaching philosophy. So after I, came, after I did all that teaching in Australia, I came to the US, and my first job said, you're going to have a 2-2 load. I said, a 2-2 load? Are you kidding? And they thought, I must, well, we could maybe make it 2-1. And I'm thinking, 2 and 2, you know, how easy is that going to be? So that's hardly any teaching compared to what I was used to, right? So in some ways, kind of being founded in this kind of more uh, hostile environment where you have to learn to be highly efficient at your teaching and research. When you come and eventually you get a slack in time, then you can be really highly productive in both. Um, and one of the ways to try and do that is people come and say, will you do consulting? And I always have the same answer as when they come and say, will you do some executive education for money? I always say, I want to be excellent at two things. I want to be excellent at research and I want to be excellent at teaching. If it doesn't do those two things, then I don't do it. Which is a little bit of a lie because I've done a lot of service related stuff. But even service-related stuff has always been research-related. Right? Um, so just to digress a little bit, if you're going to do service, pick your poison. Don't let people pick what your service is going to be. You choose it yourself. And that's why I always chose to do my service-related types of research. So coming to the US gave me a, a great opportunity um, to, to build on the, the enormous amounts of teaching I've done in Australia, but also really get into um, my research side. Um, so what I want to do is try and dispel some common myths as I see them. Right? So part of, the, um, part of the challenges I have with myself is I see things uh, in black and white rather than all the grey that exists. So I just want you to be aware of that. So common, some of the common myths are I'm going to a research school so research, so teaching isn't important. So you used to hear that a little bit, hopefully you don't hear it so much. Anymore. So I suppose my response to this myth is, you know, the first picture right there, it came from a bull. Um, but also, you know, where do the positions become available for you to get hired into? It's because there's a teaching need. Right? 
the deans and the department heads have to deal with um, poor teaching. So they want to make sure we recruit good teachers. Our rankings are based on student satisfaction and recruitment satisfaction, as well as research. Right? So the department heads and the deans are going to be looking at people who can teach well. But also, uh, as a research faculty member, I want to hire someone who's going to be successful in research. They're more likely to be successful in research if they are already good at teaching. If they're good at teaching, they're highly effective at teaching. We don't have to worry about coaching them in their teaching. And then they can also then dedicate the time towards their research. We can mentor them in one place rather than in, in two places. Right? Um, but that picture down the bottom is really like, if, if it's 60-30 or it's 40-40, 30% of your time or 40% of your time is going to be doing teaching. Who wants to be crap at something where you're spending a third of your time at doing it? Right? So perhaps a little bit of self-esteem, a little bit of self-respect. If this is part of who I am, let me try and be excellent at it. Right? Rather than just trying to, well, it's only worth 30%, I'll write that off. I mean, that, that doesn't really make much sense to me. Right? But, um, one of my favourite, as in memorable students, uh, used to come with a big, large Starbucks coffee. And uh, it came in, always came in like about 10 a.m. So I've already done about four hours worth of work. And he'd lean up against, lean up against the bench with his big Starbucks coffee. I said, like, what, what research are you going to work on today? And he goes, oh, no, today is my teaching day. I'm thinking, when I was back in Australia, you know, you have to do your research in the morning, the research at night, your teaching, and... Every minute you have, you try and get some research done. So it always stuck in my mind. I don't think you have the luxury of saying, because you're going to be teaching four hours of teaching that day, or three hours, that that's all you're going to do all day. Um, so I think what an important skill is, if you want to try and achieve excellence in both, I'm not saying that I've made it, I'm just saying that's what I aspire to, excellence in teaching and research, you have to learn how to change gears. You have to learn how to transition. Right? I was changing these slides and I had a picture of Caitlin Jenner there to try and indicate the transition, but uh, I didn't want to be politically incorrect. So I think one of the real skills that I was forced to learn when I was in Australia was I can do teaching and then I can switch my mind off and turn it straight on to research. And then I can switch it off and then turn it back on to teaching. Now it's tough and it's a skill that's involved that you can't be the Starbucks guy. You can't just come in and say, oh no, this is my teaching day. You know, so we do teaching and we do research. One of the other things that I do with teaching is I try not to double prep. So you know how you'll always prepare just before you walk into the classroom? I try not to prepare the night before and the morning off. I try and do it the morning off. Um, so what I did though, the 12 years I was in Indiana is I taught the MBA class and they said, what time do you want? I said, I want the earliest time you've got. So it's 7.45 in the morning. Which means I had to get in there about 5.30 because of my rule. I'll only do the prep the day off, right? Um, and be able to teach it that way. Another good thing about that was the students really had to want to be in my class <laughs> in order to come to the 75, 7.45 class. Uh, so that's a good kind of selection criteria uh, as well. Um, I look too young to teach MBAs. Uh, I don't get that anymore. Uh, but when I was a doctoral student in Australia, um, the faculty with me present, which was a bit awkward, voted on whether they thought that I should be able to teach an MBA class. Everyone voted yes except for my supervisor. And he later on said, nothing personal. I said, well, what could be personal about it? Uh, but he said, sometimes the only thing that we've got to defend ourselves against people is having a PhD. Okay, so then I went on and taught the, uh, the MBA class. And I was barely a couple of years older than them. And so a lot of you may actually have that thing, especially if you're going to a graduate school and you're going to teach a master's students, or you look very young, um, as, all of these, as all of these people do. Right? Um, there are ways to not look so young. Right? I mean, you can look professional. And I don't mean going and putting grey hair and doing all of that type of stuff. <laughs> but you can be professional. But I remember, you know, my supervisor turning me down to teach that MBA class really, really stuck with me. So I went into that class and I said, look, you guys know stuff and I know stuff. You have experiences and I have experiences. 
their different experiences and different knowledges, why don't we learn together? So in that way, I'm setting up a collaborative learning environment where I'm not setting myself up to fail. I'm not setting myself up to say, yeah, everybody, um, I know everything and you don't know anything. And so, hello, I'm an expert. I don't do that, still don't do that. Um, because it is a, we want to create an environment where we can learn together. And I don't care how smart you are and how much you know, if you go into an MBA classroom, for example, and say, I'm an expert, they're going to find somewhere, somehow, some piece of information that you don't know. It's like you're going to be a challenge for them. Right? And they're a little bit like sharks with blood in the water. Right? So you don't want to leave any blood uh, in the water. So that's why I always try and create this kind of collaborative learning environment. If we don't know it, can we work it out together? Okay. Teaching evaluations do not matter. And they might talk about it in the way that teaching's um, operationalized. So teaching's important, but the teaching evaluations are not important because they don't really capture how good a teacher is. People can play games. They can do things to manipulate their teaching evaluations. They don't really count. Yeah, they do. Your teaching evaluations count. So when it came to research publications, um, one, one person told me once, yeah, I mean, number of publications count because any idiot can count. Like, even a dean can count the number of publications. Same with teaching evaluations. Any idiot can look and see, are you above the bean or are you below the mean? So teaching evaluations do matter. And so don't, especially as a junior faculty member, don't get carried away with what the questions are on the teaching evaluation and trying to change them to make them a more effective measurement. Deans are never going to change them. Department heads are never going to change them because they want to see what's happening over time. Um, teaching evaluations matter when it comes to promotion and tenure. Teaching evaluations matter when you go to get a job. So we're going to hire you because we're, we have a teaching vacancy. Your teaching evaluations matter. We're going to hire you based on your research, but if you're a good teacher, you don't have to worry about that part we can kind of foster the, the research side. Um, and that's the promotion. Sometimes the faculty members say, I don't care about teaching evaluations because I'm not going to dance or I'm not going to play the game. Well, don't have to do a little bit of dancing and play the game a little, right? And so I'm going to talk about what some of those things are. Um, but, you know, one of the questions are, is, are you highly accessible and available for questions? So you might come in this morning, and maybe I received one email. And I said, well, some of you have emailed me, and I got straight back to you about the answers to these particular questions. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, he's really responsive. So there are some things that you can do. Look, these are the constraints that we live in, these teaching evaluations. Try and find your way in these constraints. Right? Try, and be, try and be a better teacher. But there are some other little things that you can fiddle around with, and I'm going to talk about what they are. Yeah, I Elizabeth. I always have that struggle with yeah. uh, teaching evaluations. Yeah. Of course, the more innovative my teaching yeah. is, the worse the evaluations are. Right, yeah. So if I just do from teaching, telling them yeah. what to do, exactly telling them, if you yeah. do this, you get this mark, and yeah. not teaching the way my approach to entrepreneurship yeah. teaching is, yeah. then evaluations are yeah. bad. So right. it's always, I mean, I want them to learn with entrepreneurship, yeah. and about entrepreneurship, yeah. but it's not happening if yeah. I want you to teach yeah. them about right. yeah. So what do you do about that? Yeah. Do you sort of put that aside until yeah. you reach right. tenure? Yeah. Or how do you so, go about so there's it? a couple of things I'd say about that. The first response is my editor's response is, I've had people come up to me at the academy management. This year I'm actually very relaxed. It's the first time in like eight years that I'm not the editor. And they'd say, my paper is so innovative, other people can't see the value in it. Right? That might be the case with your teaching. I'm not sure. Um, but also, you know, I'm going to have a slide a little bit later, was to say, you know, my students just aren't into learning. Right? Maybe it's a reflection of you, not them. Right? So if something's innovative, you have to be able to take people along that journey in order for it to be innovative, in order for it to be work, in, in order for it to be able to work. Right? Innovation means they have to adopt. It. So maybe you're innovative, but you're not implementing or exploiting that uh, innovation. Maybe take smaller steps, right? Institute some part, and the next year it's the other part, and, and next thing the other part. Or, you know, maybe, I think you're asking about expectations, maybe involve them in the innovation, right? And then they feel some form of ownership in it. Right? 
if they feel some ownership in it, they're more likely to kind of rate it higher. Um, do they understand what you're trying to achieve? You know, these, these types of things. Um, but also, every school that I go to, they'll all have a slightly different culture for the way that they teach. And in some ways, the students expect you to conform with those norms. And if you're highly innovative, you might be well outside those norms, and it's more difficult for the students to be able to learn. So, I mean, I don't know if that I answered uh, your question, but in your early stages, make sure you try and get some good teaching evaluations. Um, because if you, go, if you don't get tenure there and you go for a job somewhere else, and you say, I'm so innovative, my students don't get me, I think in the back of their mind, they're going to be going, you know, okay, all right. Um, my students do not want to learn. It's kind of almost the same sort of thing. Um, so if, if your students don't want to learn, this is the kind of the classic attribution bias, right? I mean, if good things happen, it's my own brilliance and expertise and knowledge, and if bad things happen, it's someone else's fault. I get bad teaching evaluations because of my students. Um, so part of it is you've got to try and, well, here's, here's the uh, messenger season, right? Don't shoot the messenger. The fact that the students are giving you bad teaching evaluations, don't shoot them as the messenger. It may actually be you, right? So anytime you get some negative feedback, avoid um, you know, the default position of saying, well, it's them, and say, what could I have done differently? How could I improve my teaching evaluations? What comments are they really telling me? Some of it might be fiddling with the game. Some others, it might be kind of a substantial, a substantial change. Maybe ask um, an excellent teacher to come into your class, Elizabeth, and say, what parts of this is innovative, but why isn't it taking off, right? And they might, might actually have some really good suggestions. Right? Um, so you've got to really take responsibility for the performance in the class yourself. OK, so I'm going to give you some pearls of wisdom here. So get ready. Um, learning to be a better teacher. Conan O'Brien said, if you work really hard and you're kind, amazing things will happen. So, you know, in some ways, if the students, Elizabeth, if the students can see that you're working very hard at this and that you have their best interest at heart, I think that gives you a little bit more of a, of a leeway. And the other one is, you know, is a little bit of curiosity too much to ask. Right? So I don't come in to teach this class to say I'm an expert and all the information goes one way. Um, otherwise, you benefit and I don't get anything out of this. Right? But if it's... If you go in as curious and someone asks you a question, you go, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, let's explore that a little bit further. I mean, what does that mean for this? And so you don't have to know everything if you know the process by being curious, by asking questions and exploring. Because if it means that, wouldn't that happen or would that happen? Let's think this through. And then you're always safe. I mean, you, you're never going to get caught and you're never going to get slammed. Right? And I think the students enjoy it in that particular way because we're exploring together. It's not just a one-way passage of information. 70% of success in life is showing up. <laughs> so we should be able to achieve 70%, right? So when I heard this from somebody once, I then decided that I would be the first person to pass. So I was always the first person to pass before the students came. Sometimes I'm writing on board, sometimes I'm doing things. It's very interesting what the students say before class starts. I mean, they must think we can't hear them. <laughs> um, but you want some good feedback, Elizabeth, just go early to class and you'll, you'll hear them talking, uh, often about other teachers. About but even then, it's still very interesting. I feel like saying, well, what about Jeff and Bowen? Uh, <laughs> he's his own work with Jeff. Um, so I always go first, and I always try and be the last to go. Okay, so now we're saying, now you're making this huge time commitment. No, I'm actually more effective in my time management because they will ask me questions before class and they'll ask me questions after class. And what does that mean? It means that they get a chance to ask a question rather than take it out in my teaching evaluation. Or they ask a question and don't come to my office and take half an hour with, I really love your class. And then you go, I really love having you in my class. And I <laughs> and go backwards and forwards <laughs> for 10 minutes. And that's them saying, I really want to get an A, and me saying, I really want to get my teaching evaluation. <laughs> and then eventually we actually get to the thing. Um, and this is kind of like a more effective way to be able to do it. So I really like this idea. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, just show up. Be there first. It just kind of shows you're enthusiastic, shows you're a professional, 
shows that this is important and they, they are important to you as well. Um, be professionally available. Um, so when people want to see you, you're the cookie man, right? You probably, you'll probably like this, right? So you have parties at your house, so all the students love you, all that type of thing. I'm not sure that's highly sustainable, right? Eventually you get married, the wife's not going to like it. Um, <laughs> so I took this from when I was back in Australia. I said, in my course outline, I'll be professionally available for you. Here are my office hours. I know some people who sleep with the, you know, their, uh, their iPhone next to them just in case the students in the middle of the night have a question or something. I mean, that just seems nuts to me because it's, it's almost teaching them the wrong thing. If I'm your boss at work, I'm not going to be answering your emails at, you know, at, at midnight. I'm professionally available. And I also say to them, send me an email. And I'll normally respond within an hour, but typically within one minute. So I often have the email going while I'm, 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 while I'm teaching doing my research back at, uh, in my office. And I like the email because, the, once again, it's not like, I love your class and I love you and blah, blah, blah. Get straight to the point, you can address it directly, and boom, they're happy, they didn't have to see me, and I'm happy that we've been able to exchange that information relatively quickly. So I always try and get the, um, uh, the email situation going. Um, as I said, the course outlines like a contract, really kind of sets what those expectations are. Uh, are going to be. But there are some faculty who do have parties at their house and, and uh, are available all the time. I don't think that's, that's uh, beneficial as a teacher or beneficial as a researcher or as a faculty member. Um, I think fairness, not leniency, and I think this is what were your expectations, is, you know, there's the um, please sir, I want some more. I think if you bend over um, and you're so flexible, then they'll take advantage of that and take you in a million different directions that are not sustainable. So, I mean, you are the leader of the class. And just because we're participating, just because I'm curious, just because we're exploring together, doesn't mean that I'm not the leader. I lead the discussion. And I lead the course. I'll use feedback, but I usually use feedback, I tell them, for the next semester. I don't start changing the rules of the game while the game's being played because you're bound to hurt somebody uh, and not the other person. So I always take on feedback, and I always tell them I'll consider it for the following semester and not this semester. One trick I used to do was just before the end of the semester, just before they did their teaching evaluations, I would actually ask them for feedback. Sometimes I'd put it on the board, positives or negatives, right? One, that gave me excellent feedback for next, the next time. But also we know from research that people are more satisfied if they've had a chance to air their grievances know that from marketing research, right? So I thought, get them to air their grievances before they do the teaching evaluations, and my teaching evaluations will be nice. Who knows if that works, but stands to reason, right? Um, people are always asking about finding their purpose. I think everyone's purpose is to teach other people about the thing they enjoy doing the most. Whatever you enjoy doing most, teach it. Right? Um, there's this wonderful thing called academic freedom, which means we do this. So. Uh, department head says, well, I might assign this course to you, and I might assign this course to you, and I say, well, you can assign whatever you like, but this is what I'm going to teach. <laughs> I'm going to teach what interests me. And the reason why I teach what interests me for a couple of reasons is, you know, if it interests me, I'm more likely to be good at it, I'm more likely to be knowledgeable at it, I'm more likely to be interested in learning it. But also, my enthusiasm on that topic is more likely to be contagious to the students, and they're going to enjoy it as well. So in a lot of instances, I, I teach entrepreneurship or, I, or new venture strategy or whatever he calls it, I just teach what I want to teach. is more like making decisions under uncertainty. And then I can relate a lot to what my research is. And I research those areas because I'm, I'm interested in them and I've developed expertise in them. Right? So, so then you can be enthusiastic. Right? And if you're enthusiastic, um, people will also be enthusiastic. But what happens if you can't be enthusiastic? Fake it. Boy, am I that old that you don't even know that Harry met Sally? Man, oh man, jeez. Now you're really making me feel old. Um, the other thing is be yourself. Right? So don't... Oh shit, so that just happened, right? Your joke is funny. False, your joke is not funny. <laughs> so whenever I tell jokes, um, ever since I've been here in the US, for 20 years I've been here, when I tell a joke and people don't laugh, I just say it's a cultural thing. 
<laughs> so that's, uh, but so you try and be um, try and be yourself. So I used to show at the start, you know, because we talked about um, who we are. Right? You're talking about that, um, not so much as the legitimacy, but just kind of let them know a little bit about yourself. I showed them an Australian Rules football preview, right? and in that they're taking the marks and they're doing the kicks, and then at one stage they're doing all the hits, the knockouts, and everything. And I'd say, well, that's what happens to you if you come and ask for higher grades. Um, so you do tell them a little bit about your life, but it's not so much as, a, as a, an attempt to gain legitimacy. It's, a, it's an attempt that they get to know you perhaps on a little bit more of a personal level. I always try and find, and it always comes out, I try and find a foil. Right? And so by a foil I mean when things get quiet, or I need to jazz things up a little bit, or I need to kind of you know, spruce up the argument, I know someone to go to. Right. At this stage, it's been Elizabeth. <laughs> so I know I can always go to Elizabeth, and she'll smile, and she'll say something, let's say, innovative, right? <laughs> um, so she can be my foil. And so it's, and that person normally enjoys it. I know Elizabeth's probably not enjoying it now, but that person quite often enjoys being the centre of attention as well. So there are ways, people you can go to, you know, someone who will always have an answer on this, or how does that apply to the agricultural industry, or... You know what I'm saying? So you know the people in order to go to to stimulate the discussion. So why do I have a picture of a postman there? Under the topic, be yourself. Anyway? Well, I was looking at these slides on the plane on the way down. I, I, I've got no idea why I had one there either. So, <laughs> so that's just as well. I think it's got something to do with you always deliver, but I still don't see how it relates. <laughs> what, does someone say something? Be yourself. You can't deliver what you don't have. Oh, okay, all right, good. All right, um, so I say be yourself, but if you can't be yourself, be someone else. And, and there's, there's some seriousness to this too, because I think um, if I kind of diagnose myself, to be a good researcher, you've got to be an introvert. You've got to enjoy being by yourself with your butt on the seat writing. You have to enjoy that, otherwise you can't really be a researcher. Yeah, we, we do co-authoring, but I mean, about being an introvert. And an introvert doesn't mean you can't be with people, it just means it takes energy to do it. And so when I go to teach, I think I become a different version of myself, a more extroverted version, of it, almost like an actor. You kind of act out something that's still you, but it's actually different from you, and, it's, and it takes energy to be able to do it. Right? So I mean, so you won't know who this is then, because you're all so young. No question. Yeah, but Sybil, right? And she was the one that had a million different personalities, right? So we take on different selves. We had different personalities, right? Um, yeah, an extrovert, someone who is energized by interactions with other, others. Introvert, someone who runs away from extroverts, right? So you've got to know, you've got to know yourself. Um, it doesn't matter what part I play, I try and commit myself 100%. So it's interesting, though, when you become a teacher, is try and find, it has to still be you, uh, but it has to be an entertaining you. It can't be your boring research you. Right? And it'll take a little while to just find out what it's like. You can visit other professors. Jeff McMullen's an excellent teacher. You can go and watch him teach. But I can't teach like Jeff McMullen. You've got to find your own unique way of being able to teach. And it might take a little bit of time to find it. And look at, looking at different models, stealing different eyes from different people, and combining them in a way that's kind of unique uh, to you. Um, dealing with troubled students. Okay, so do we know what movie this is? This is a history lesson, people. <laughs> Animal House. Have you not seen Animal House? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so what's interesting, though, I found very rarely do I get some, some student complaints that really get heated. And the second they start getting heated over email, I say, can you come to my office and we'll discuss it. And it's amazing how easier things go when they're sitting next to you than how abusive and dis you know, disrespectful they can be over email. So just keep that in mind. If things seem like they're escalating in email, do it face to face. You don't want to face this student, you don't want to do it, but when they come in, they, you know, they're, they're cowering, they're, you know, they, it, it normally works itself out. Um, I always point back to the, the syllabus. I say, well, first day I told you, this is the course outline, 
These are my expectations of you. These are your expectations of me. I'm, I'm holding you to those expectations. Um, if a bad student in class, use your foil. Right? So you say, well, Jimmy doesn't do it that way. Or well, Jimmy, what do you have to say about this sort of behavior? You, it's, it's, it's tough. You've got to be a little bit careful about how to do it. But sometimes you can use the foil. Sometimes the bad student can be the foil. But you don't bend over backwards to help the bad student because that creates a mob. Then everyone becomes a bad student. But with the smoking one there, it's peer pressure. So you're all in this class to be able to learn. I'm in this class to be able to learn. We're going to learn from each other. If someone continuously disrupts the class, it not only affects my performance, but it affects your ability to learn. Right? So maybe the peer pressure can help bring that student in. Um, but it's always tough to try and work out how to, how to deal with these, these students. Um, grading exams. So it's the, the actual, the absolute bane of your life as a professor. It's the only thing that we do that's agonizingly painful. And so what I normally do is just rip the band-aid straight off. So I grade them straight away and I have feedback to them, detailed feedback to them within 24 hours. Now I know that means I've got smaller classes. But taking longer doesn't make it less painful. In some ways, it's like that dark cloud over your head. Just get rid of it. So I try and get it graded as soon as possible. And I say to the students something like, feedback is very important for your part of the learning process. And the sooner that you get it, the more likely you are to be able to learn. So um, please find my feedback below. I realize that this is a subjective assessment and you may not agree with it, but I want to be able to give you this feedback as quickly as I can so that you can learn. And then I, then I give them the so at least when it comes to teaching evaluations, they say, yes, was prompt, give feedback, gave exams back quickly, that, that type of thing. Um, just don't let it drag on and on and on. You might want to think about the type of exam that you give. Um, you want to be able to decrease the amount of grading that you have to do, but at the same time, you want to be able to give them sufficient feedback and avoid arguments. So I never give multiple choice. They could always argue one way or other. Well, B isn't B also right? Um, so I just kind of use these kind of shorter essay style questions. Um, you might also want to consider that if you've got a three hour class, don't give a three hour exam, give a two hour exam. Because if you give a two hour exam and a three hour exam, the outcomes are going to be almost exactly the same, other than you do a lot, you do a third of a less, a third of a less grading with the two hour exam. So sometimes shorten up the period for the exam. Don't make it, don't make it longer. Um, there are issues about grading participation. Um, grading participation is always tough. I always had my hand up, you never called on me. Oh, well, you know, uh, so they're all, I mean, it's worth trying to speak to some other people who, who give participated grades exactly how they do it. Some people take a log, have a student in class take a log of what every person said throughout the whole class. Other times, I just tell them it's a purely subjective uh, experience. But one thing's for certain, it's very hard to participate well if you're not here. Right. That's the first thing. So they say, do you take attendance? That's my response to that. And also I say, it's very hard to participate if you haven't prepared for class. And so, there are different tricks in order to try and grade participation. It might be worth talking to your, your senior faculty for that. Um, grading teams, two minutes run. Grading teams uh, is good because the larger the team, the less grading you have to do. Except for when at the end of the semester you have to give some people A's, some A minuses, B pluses, you know, you know the grading scheme, right? And the thing is, if you have too much group work, everyone just clusters. It's hard to kind of distinguish people, kind of differentiate people for grade. So I don't actually do teamwork uh, in my class. Elizabeth doesn't like that. You love teamwork, do you? I do. Okay, because good. Because I tell them it's part of their, of their learning goal. Right, and it's what you do in real life and everything like that. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I have this book, and in that I talk about tenure-related stuff, job-related stuff, this, this presentation on uh, teaching-related stuff, um, and other 